Welcome back to Real Estate Mindset. Today's video is going to be absolutely bonkers. And the first thing I'm going to say is happy Friday, TGIF. So I hope you guys have a great weekend. Hopefully, uh, we learn a lot today. So this video is going to be really, really good, you guys. I'm going to have it uh, you know, jam-packed with what's going on in the housing market right now. You guys know I love doing morning lives because it allows us really to follow up on what's going on with the housing market overall. We can look at the 10-year, the you know, break-even. We can look at all kinds of stuff, guys. But you know, the first thing I want to say is yesterday, you know, I want to acknowledge the elephant in the room. I went fishing for 24 hours. I went fishing for 24 hours. I caught this massive alligator gar. And I posted the picture on my community tab. And honestly, guys, I forgot that there was blood in the picture. And I got a little bit roasted from people like, Travis, you didn't release that one because there's blood on it. And you guys, I got to tell you, like, I'm, I don't kill things. Like, I'm not a killer. I'm one of the most conservation-based people you've ever met in your life. So, but I also forgot about the blood. And I'm just going to tell you guys what happened is, is like, I wasn't expecting to catch some monster dinosaur from the beach, right? I've never caught a gar before. It was like a six foot gar. And <laughs> those things have scales that are like razors. It will rip you to shreds and it has a jaw like an alligator. So I didn't know how to like, it's, it's hard to handle those types of things. And what happened basically is like when you catch it, it comes onto the shore, it starts thrashing everywhere. So the fish looked a little bit dirty and a little bit bloody. Uh, but it was released. I can assure you guys that. So I'm sorry if I offended you because of the blood. I just thought it was something super cool to do and something that we can look at instead of like just the housing market stuff. I want everyone to remember to enjoy your life, right? We don't want to be stuck with anxiety, stuck waiting. We want to really kind of just stay focused on the important things in life, like who we spend our time with right? And what we do with our time. But nevertheless, I wanted you guys to know that I actually really do love animals. So I'm going to introduce uh, a new character on this show, which is my Maltese right here. This is my little dog. I want to be an investor. One of the first steps of being a real estate investor is getting a Maltese. So wanted to introduce this to you. Um, now I'm going to name her Brightness. So this is Brightness, middle name, Johnny, last name, Fly. So this is Brightness, Johnny Fly. I'm going to put this little puppy over here. So, you know, you guys, I like animals. I don't mean to be like, oh, you know, men with little dogs are feminine. I don't mean to say that. Um, I just think it's a little bit weird. But anyways, guys, I really appreciate you. I'm just trying to be lighthearted. Good morning, Earl. Appreciate you being number one. There's my man, Dean, Mary. I'm getting your guys' emails. I responded to a lot of emails this morning. I appreciate you guys. There's my man, Florida Beach Bum. I wish I was a beach bum. Raise your hand if you wish you could afford to be a beach bum. I do. Anyways, here's my man, Don't Move. He has his hand to the pulse of the house market. Don't move. I want to hear about your market analysis. I want you guys to be doing market analysis using the data. Find the deal. And I'm going to show you guys in my local housing market what it's looking like in Kingwood. That's how we'll start the video. And I was able to find houses 20% under market value. 20% under market value all over the place in Kingwood. So I'm going to show you guys that in a minute. There's my man, Steve-O. Good morning, Steve-O, sir, from the West Coast. Appreciate you. There's my man, Jackie and Deborah, And then Christy. Nice to see you, Christy. There's my man, Robert. I appreciate all your support. Melissa, Melissa, I want to see big things from you. I want to see you achieve your goals. I want to see you grow and I want to see you do well. Melissa, I thank you for all of your support do well. Let me know when that test is due so that we can pay it. Okay. She's going to be a realtor. Show Melissa some love, you guys. Seriously. Show that woman some love. Steve, good morning to you as well. TW, I am blessed. So are you. Love hearing from you. Uh, Noah, I appreciate you as well. WTH. There's my man. There's my man, John. Matt. Good morning, Matt. Johnny. Johnny, how are you, man? Look at what the cat <laughs> I love Johnny MFH. Good morning. Good morning, Bella, Steve. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry this is taking so long. I just really appreciate you guys. My core subscribers, you guys keep me going. You have no idea. Bella, good morning. Joe, good morning. Manuel, everyone. Tony, uh, believe in the word. Love that name. All right, guys, we're going to get started. Wanted to just give you guys a shout out. Now, what I want to do first, you guys, is I want to bring up my MLS, okay? And MLS is a multiple listing service. The MLS is really what makes realtors so powerful. And just real quick, if you're a realtor, if you're watching this, here's the thing, you guys, I still have empathy for realtors, right? I, I understand what they go through. They chase a dream. Maybe they're sold by a broker. It's a commission only thing. But the reason I'm so hard on realtors is 
we need to be, society needs to be because the consumers are being served in injustice. So I'm not like trying to bash realtors. What I'm trying to say is there is a massive divide in great realtors versus everyone else. And there's a lot of everyone else, you guys. So I hope by me accessing my MLS, showing you guys these market analysis that either if you're a realtor, you can do it, or you can ask your realtor to do it for you. And you guys, I have been really disappointed and I love you guys so much, but I've been really disappointed because I get text messages, I get emails, and I have people uh, ask me, Travis, is this a good deal? And what's my first question, guys? I wanna be so proud of you. What's my first question? Did you do a market analysis? What does the data say? right? We have to lean on ourselves somewhat. We have to lean on ourselves somewhat. Buying a house is a huge transaction, okay? Look at the video I did yesterday on Lennar. That was potential fraud, you know, back what, 20 years ago, you guys? You have to trust yourself. In order to trust yourself, normally we need to have confidence in our ability to understand what it looks like to get our goals. And I want that for you guys so badly. And you know what, guys? I get picked on all, I get picked on, harassed and bullied all the time. People call me, you know, horrible names saying I'm just, I'm lying to people, right? They're not taking any consideration to like, I actually believe what I'm saying with all of my heart. And you guys, things are getting really shaky right now. Things are getting completely out of control. So anyways, uh, if you're a realtor, um, I hope you're stepping up. I hope you're using the data. If you're out there looking for houses, and I know some of you guys are because I've been getting your emails. Um, why aren't you guys using the data? Please use the data, you guys. Please use the data. Look for the wedge. Look for the cash flow. It's really important. And I, I really want to see more of that. Really appreciate you guys. So I'm going to get started right now. Again, I'm going to access MLS. This is the one thing that's really good about realtors. Look at Johnny. I mean, see, Johnny's out there, man. You know, oh, you guys, here's the thing. I want you guys to comment below. All right, Johnny, I forgot to tell them, Johnny. So me and Johnny, or I'm sorry, Johnny and I, apologize for that. Johnny and I, good morning, sacred, I see you. Johnny and I are going to do a, hopefully he doesn't, you know, get cold feet, but we're going to do a live broadcast tomorrow. So Johnny is going to come on tomorrow. If you guys, hopefully you guys will join us for tomorrow morning's live. And he's going to give us a story about what he's seeing in the Boise market. So let me know guys, if you want Johnny on the air. Okay. So come up, comment Johnny. Okay. If you want Johnny to come on, comment Johnny. If you don't want Johnny to come on, put brightness like the Maltese right there. See the Maltese? That's brightness right there. So if you want Johnny, comment Johnny. If there's no Johnny, just put brightness. Comment if you guys can real quick. Let us know if you guys want Johnny on here. Personally, I love Johnny. I think he's a great guy. Anyways, Johnny, we'll see. We'll see if the people want you on, Johnny. I think they will. Personally, I'm going to go into the MLS right now, you guys. Um, let's see here. Now, here's what I want to show you guys. Whoops, sorry about that. I'm going to do it like this. All right. Okay, we got some Johnnies. Look at that. We got some people saying Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the brightness? No one, no one's saying brightness. No one's saying brightness. Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. Okay, Johnny. You got some love, brother. I love you, Johnny. I think we all love you, to be honest with you, Johnny. I mean, we're all in this together. Let's be honest. Uh, let me adjust this real quick. Okay. So here's what I'm going to show you guys. Okay. I'm going to show you Kingwood. Now, there has been disadvantages and advantages of me keeping us locked into Kingwood. The reason why I kept us locked into Kingwood for the last year is because it's a small market and I didn't want to like deceive you and cherry pick the data. I figured if we stayed monitoring a very small market, it would be easier for most of us to understand trends and to understand what to look for. Okay. But I'm going to show you guys just one more time. I'm going to do is this will take me two minutes at most. I'm going to do a quick market analysis on Kingwood so that I can show you there are multiple houses in Kingwood right now that are 20% under market value. 20% under market value right now in Kingwood. So the reason I'm telling you guys this is that, you know, the premise is, is don't wait for a quote unquote crash, right? And I would agree with that. A lot of that, I think there's certain things that should transpire first. But what my point is, is guys, if we know how to find a great deal, we could find a great deal in any market. Now, the problem is, is right now there's like almost no great deals overall in every market. But the thing is, is when you have those skills, it's like, that's like riding a bike. You guys, once you apply the skills that I'm trying to teach you, you guys should remember it forever. And the, here's the crazy thing, you guys, it's easy. Like this stuff is super easy. I'm so sorry. I'm getting carried away. Let me go back here. Okay. So I'm going to go to Kingwood. I'm going to just do the last year. I'm going to put 360 days for all sold properties. Okay. You guys see this? This is such a great service. I would, you know, 
if it was me and I was a consumer and I wasn't a realtor, I would be trying to sit with my realtor and have them take me through the entire market because this data is mint. This data is key. Sold property data, you guys, is important. Now, in the last year, there was 466 homes sold in Kingwood. So you guys see that right here? I have 466 homes sold in Kingwood over the last year. I'm going to select all of this data. I'm going to go to stats down here. I'm going to hit tabular. This is very easy. I can also do market charts. But here's what I wanted to show you guys. The medium, I'm sorry, the average price per square foot is 146 and the median is 143. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 143.38. Okay. Let me show you guys this. I'm just going to make this so simple. You guys can see I've already been doing math this morning. Red, red handed, you guys tell me. Okay. So I'm going to take $143.38. That's what the average price per square foot is over the last year in Kingwood. Okay. Now remember I said we got to go hyper local subdivision. Okay. But this is just a general a little breakdown for you guys. So let's times this by 80%, which would be a 20% reduction. Okay. Which would give us $114.70 for a home to gross, right? Obviously there's like condition and location, but if I can essentially find a home in Kingwood that is selling for $114 a square foot, then I will have found a home that a basically is selling for potentially 20% under market value. Do y'all, y'all tracking with me? If you guys can just let me know you're tracking with me. This is so easy. You guys, everyone should be doing this. This is so easy. Okay. So now we have an understanding. I need to find what? $114 a square foot, right? Everyone with me? So let's see if I can find $114 a square foot in Kingwood. I'm going to go to active listings here. I am going to put the city of Kingwood. Remember, you guys, we've been watching Kingwood for the last year. I can't hide no data. Everyone has this data. There's probably even more sales in Kingwood just because I've been using this as such a strong reference point. But look at guys. So active listings, there's 94 listings in Kingwood. Let's look at the results. Okay. Remember what I do? Again, this is what realtors usually do with investors. If investors want to look at a lot of data, I'm going to rearrange the price per square foot and look at this, guys. Look at, first of all, do you guys remember when, what was this, like five or six weeks ago, I showed you this and there was nothing under $120 a square foot? Do you guys remember that? Look at under my picture right here where my mouse is at. A few weeks ago, go back to my lives. If, if you if you don't believe me, a few weeks ago, we found nothing under 120. And then we found like one. And then we had two. And now we have five properties listed, you guys, five properties listed, which represents over 5% of the inventory that are listed for under $120 a square foot. Now, remember, look at this. Okay. Remember, this is what I need to find in order to find a listing with 20% wedge, which means 20, a wedge is under market value. Wedge is like when you move into the house, you have a safety net. You can still refinance potentially. You could still uh, sell potentially because you have value in your house. Okay. Uh, look at, so $114. Look at two, two, two comps right here. I have two properties right now. Look at this. These two properties, first two properties are selling for 20% under market value. If we look at the square footage method, you see that now, if I wanted to get serious, I would drive to the property. I would do a deeper analysis on the subject uh, property subdivision. Uh, these subdivisions is Kings Mill and Kings Manor. So I would do a more in-depth thing and I would get serious about this, but this allows me to pinpoint kind of what's going on. And you guys want to look at the houses. So first of all, remember, this is really important. I'm about to tell you. Okay. And I keep telling you guys this, the bigger the house over the median size, the less price per square foot you're going to get. So in other words, you guys, the bigger the house, the less price per square foot. Y'all tracking with me? So like when I, if I were to invest uh, in a house uh, or even if it was my primary residence, I would probably try to find a property that was close to the median size of that area. So what I mean is, is if most houses have 2000 square feet, then I want to buy a house that's 2000 square feet. If most houses have 2,000 square feet, but I buy a 4,000 square foot house, what happens, guys? I now have the biggest house on the block. I don't want the biggest house on the block per se. You know, there's a little bit more grace when it's your primary residence, but I'm treating my primary as an investment. But I'm also like, I'll, like for me personally, I want a big house. I don't care if it's cheaper per square foot. I want a bigger house. I have a big family. Okay, but look at the second one. The second one is actually relatively close to the median square footage. It's sitting at 2,700 square feet, still a little big, 
but more reasonable. And I've actually done an analysis on this already. And let's look at this, guys. So this is the second most affordable house in all of Kingwood. Let's look at the condition. And again, remember what I'm saying here. Why am I showing you guys this? If this is what your realtor should be doing for you, right? Or if you're a realtor, this is what you should be doing for your client. Let's take the emotions. Let's take out the assumptions, presumptions, and all of this uh, neo craziness. And let's just talk about data. Let's just talk about simple math. Let's make it less confusing. You guys see? Now look at this house. You guys, this is not a junky house. So what does this tell us? Look at this house. This is a super nice house. This tells us the market's all messed up right now. The market is all messed up. I can't believe they can't sell this house. I mean, look at this kitchen. This is a nice house, you guys. I mean, you maybe can use some crown molding, right? I'll put some crown molding on there. You know, I don't really like the floors. It's nothing special, but look, I mean, it's nice, you know, and it has a little bit of room, maybe a little bit to put some work into it to increase the value. But I mean, this is honestly, this is, this is a decent house. This is a decent house. And that's really, you know, how you guys do that right there. I, I hope what, what you guys are saying, okay, is basically it's really important. If you guys want to keep your thumb to the pulse of the housing market, you have to you you have to figure out a way to access MLS data. You have to. Here's the thing. You can access that as a consumer by going to like Zillow or Redfin and places like that. The problem is, guys, unless generally unless you're a realtor and you have the matrix or MLS membership, you can't access sold data. And sold data is king. Everything else is opinion and presumptions and assumptions. The sole data is king because the sole data tells us what's going on right now. So again, if you guys want to follow your own house market, what I would do is I would probably go to Zillow or Redfin or work with the realtor and I would be tracking my market on a daily basis. And I would take notes like what's happening, more price cuts, what's going on in this neighborhood because I'm not, I don't want to be stuck on the sideline and I don't want to be swept in the wind. I want to be in a position to where I'm beating the recession. I'm beating the headwinds. I'm beating the credit tightening. I'm beating these things. I'm staying ahead of it because I'm saving more money. My purchasing power is still good and I'm preparing for the worst, hoping for the best, preparing for the worst. Now, our next segment, you guys, I hope you enjoy this. This is going to be a tale of two cities. This is an article from Fortune. Let me do my timestamp real quick. Okay, so we're going to go into this next thing right now, you guys. Uh, again, this is an article from Fortune Magazine. This is going to go into some really crazy details. Um, we're going to focus on prices because there are some metro areas. <laughs> yes, oh my gosh. The price decline is out of control right now. Now, this is a cool article because this is going to go into the uh, basically a tale of two housing markets, the red hot bottom and the ice cold top. And it's going to break down luxury. Good morning, Wolf. I see you, my brother, Roof. I see you, Sid. I see you, Ray. I see you, Dave. I love you guys. Um, this is going to go into luxury versus affordable. So this is going to give us a lot more details on how poorly luxury is doing right now. But I also think it's a good opportunity for us to like take a step back and let's talk about what's it like, what's a tell of two housing markets right now. Okay. The first thing is home ownership, home ownership right now. You guys, I'll get into this article, but home ownership right now, completely Tale of two cities, tale of two cities, right? You have pre-2022 homeowners, probably flourishing. They can get a cash out refinance. They can get a HELOC, probably a three or 4% interest rate, $100,000, $200,000 in equity. That's pre-2022. Post-2022 buyers, probably a lot of those people are stuck in their house without an ability to resell, I'm sorry, to sell or to refinance without having to come out of their pocket. Even if their metro area, say they went up year over year 5%, it still costs roughly 8% to sell your house. 6% realtors, 2% fees and taxes, okay? So we have home ownership to tell to tells, right? Then we have inventory. So inventory, let's talk about that. Existing, we need more of it. We need more existing inventory. Now I also say, you guys, there will always be forced selling in every single housing market. We know that there's going to be in my, my calculations, anywhere from two to 3 million forced sales every single year. Right? So we're going to get that. Nevertheless, we have flourishing inventory with new home construction and we have limited inventory with existing 
Huge divide right there, you guys. Absolutely huge divide. Now, also, Tale of Two, uh, Tale of Two Cities as well. Price decline. We have massive price declines West Coast. And then there's the East Coast and then Texas in the middle. So there's massive, massive headwinds just depending on your market, which is why I'm saying it's so important to understand local trends. So local, guys, you go into the subdivision. And literally, like, if, if you're interested, I'm not saying now's the time to buy. But, like, for me, if I'm interested in a house, I'm doing the data, but I'm driving my butt there. And I want to make sure that there's no dogs. I want to see if there's train tracks. I want to smell the inside of the house, right? I want to do all of those things. But this article is going to go in the difference of luxury versus affordable housing and basically how affordable housing is doing actually really well and how luxury is being completely melted down, all right? I will link this in my description as well. Now, the article starts, mortgage rates have surged uniformly across the country, going from just 3% in September of 2021, so 3% all the way up to 7.33% as of Wednesday. That represents 43% of purchasing power wiped out. When we add student loans to the mix, that's even more. And I know I'm a loan officer. I know that student loan payments are calculated into DTI. Nevertheless, right now, that's not coming out of the pockets of consumers. So I understand it's a DTI thing, but it's still not coming out of the pockets of consumers. This goes on. However, the response from housing prices has been anything but uniform, leading to a fascinating divergence in the nation's housing market. It's really a tale of two housing markets, one red hot at the bottom and another ice cold at the top. And they're referring to like at the top, a luxury homes and at the bottom, affordable housing. In many regional housing markets, higher end homes have experienced price declines while starter homes have remained relatively unscathed. And don't forget you guys, where are these institutional investors purchasing? These institutional investors, they're not, how do I say this? Okay, I'm just gonna say they're not necessarily foolish, right? They want the affordable housing because they understand the box is bigger. If investors were purchasing luxury houses, there would be less people interested. The more affordable something is, the more the box, the bigger the box, right? The more people want that property. So anyways, very interesting. What's going on as housing affordability deteriorated across the country under the weight of higher mortgage rates, home buyers simply adjusted their expectations. Is that right? Did home owners, uh, I didn't adjust my expectations. If anything, my expectations are even stronger now. To be honest with you, I don't think we should adjust our expectations. I think our expectations should be to get a great deal on a home we love. I think that should be everyone's expectations. While the upper echelons of the market uh, of the market out of reach for many buyers, they've turned with attention to smaller, lower priced homes and doing so they've kept the bottom half of the market relatively warmer. And what I want to show you guys is how this breaks it down from metro area to metro area. This is insane. So let me just read this last part and I'll show you this chart here. Put another way, 30 out of the nation's 40 largest housing markets set all-time highs for lower price homes in July, underscoring the enduring appeal of more affordable housing options. This is so, the fact that it's like, the, the fact that home prices have been sustained this long is, is so shocking to me. I have seen price declines so many times, including Houston. Someone messaged me the other day, like, what about Houston? Houston never goes down. No, that's wrong. Houston, I think, went down 20 some percent in the 90s or 80s, 20 some percent. Anyways, guys, take a look at this. This is super cool. Uh, and we're going to get into some videos here in a minute. I'm going to zoom in on this so you guys can see how cool this is. All right. Now, on the left side is your lower price tier, so like more affordable houses. Middle, what's up, Orlando? You guys, show this man some love. I love Orlando. This guy, you know what? I'm going to tell you something. People pick on him. They pick on me too. say all we talk about is doom. But the reality is, is what we're trying to do is empower people and make them aware and spread love. And I'm going to tell you, this man has helped me become a better man and a better father and a better husband. And I will always appreciate it for that. Orlando, it's nice to see you, brother. So anyways, this is the lower price tier, middle price tier, and upper price tier, okay? Now, here's what's interesting. Somehow, it's zero, right? So, okay, on average, whatever, Redfin, whatever, okay? U.S. is zero for lower price. Middle tier is zero, but look at upper tier. And again, this is the average. Right now, the upper tier homes are down 2.58%. Okay. That's on average. Okay. And then on average, no homes are up. 
look at this. On average, people are down 8% because remember, it costs 8% to sell. And to refinance guys can cost anywhere from 2 to 4%. In other words, it costs money to do stuff with your house. You can't just do stuff with your house. People are going to gouge you and going to want your equity. It's how the business is set up. Okay, now look at New York. Really nothing in New York, but look at Los Angeles, you guys. Middle. T uh, first of all, what's low tier in Los Angeles? What's low tier in Los Angeles? Does Los Angeles have any low tier? I don't look at upper tier down 5%. Okay, same thing. Dallas is across the board as well. But look at guys, when I start going down here, look at some of these price declines, man. Phoenix, okay. People are like, oh, Phoenix is fine. Phoenix is fine. There's no inventory. Yeah, there's not a lot of inventory for existing. But look at the look at the price decline, even with affordable housing in Phoenix. Phoenix, if I'm not mistaken, has the biggest price declines for affordable housing. No, Austin does. It's almost almost the biggest. Okay. Phoenix is down 5.6%. Why aren't the realtors over there talking about this, right? They're just like, nah, they're wrong. We don't have enough inventory. Buy an overpriced house. We need to make a commission. Shame on the crash bros. You need to buy right now. I mean, they're saying these crazy wacko stuff and people are just like, all right, we're going to buy. We're desperate. And then, oh, I lost 5.6% and I lost 7% if I'm a normal in the middle and down 5.77% for luxury. Look at San Francisco. San Francisco. High end, okay, down double digits. San Francisco, high end housing right now. This is this is this report, you guys. I think it's two days old. This isn't old data. Um, this down, San Francisco's down 13.42%. High end, incredibly insane. Riverside, California, another place where there's high migration in Riverside. I did a video out there. High migration in Riverside, nevertheless, it's extremely unaffordable. If it wasn't such a high migrated area this would be worse. But Riverside's down across the board as well. Look at Seattle. Seattle was a big surprise. Seattle's down double digits on the high end at 10.69%. That is humongous. Let me scroll down here and let me show you guys a little bit more. Look at Austin. Now, what I find interesting about Austin is like they're not down the most when it comes to the high end, but look at the low end. This basically means that almost everyone that purchased in Austin over the last year is significantly underwater and essentially from an equity standpoint trapped in their house. Almost every single person in Austin is trapped in their house right now. Why aren't we reporting on this, guys? Why, why isn't the news reporting on this? Think about it. Why? Why aren't they reporting? Well, I would say the first reason is, is well, we all know real estate's big money. And when you go messing with big money, people are going to shut you down. I mean, look what's going on on YouTube. We have humongous price decline still. And people are saying, no, the housing market's rebounded. There's no inventory. And not only that, you guys, there's some metro areas, 30, 40% price cuts. I'll show you that on another video. Anyways, here's Las Vegas. Same thing with Las Vegas across the board. I mean, here's Jacksonville, you guys. Jacksonville's starting to fill it. Here's Nashville, uh, San Jose, another California. I mean, the price declines right now. We're absolutely insane. Absolutely insane. But not as insane as how many people continue to buy. Now, we're going to go into our housing market uh, update real quick, guys. We're going to do a market report. We're going to start with the 10-year treasury. 10-year treasury, holy smokes, is, it, is the 10-year treasury making moves? So this morning, the 10-year has really been... Um, all over the place. It's at 4.21 right now. It ended yesterday up. This was actually up slightly today. You guys can see it did go positive. It's now going down right now. I find it very, very intriguing what's happening right now to treasuries because we're seeing the money. So I'm, we're also going to listen to a video um, from Danielle uh, Booth Martino, and she's going to go into a lot more of this. Uh, but nevertheless, guys, this is intriguing. The high end yield or the long term yields right now, 4.2 is is high. And let me show you what's going on. OK, look at this. This is the reverse repo market. This is where the banks keep our money. This is the one day treasury. So remember, look at how much like I remember we were reporting on this. Look, it's balanced. I'm like the Fed wants this money. They want to burn this money. And then look at all of a sudden uh, about what, two weeks ago, the reverse repo market has been plummeting. Now, this is especially good news. Now, one of the reason, guys, is in my opinion, the reverse repo market is plummeting like this, which is really, really astonishing, is because the market feels the Fed is pretty much done hiking rates. 
So because the market feels that the Fed is pretty much, the market feels the Fed is pretty much done hiking rates, this money right here wants to take advantage of the longer yield interest rates like this 10 year, okay? So maybe it's not the 10 year, maybe it's the two year, maybe it's the five year, but again, it's very interesting when we follow the money. This is being burned out of our system right here. Okay, through quantitative tightening. Now, let me show you what the market is thinking, guys. This is the CME Fed Watch tool. This is really intriguing. Um, you know, there's a lot of speeches yesterday about inflation. Here's the market. Let me refresh this because this changed. And okay, so it went back down. So when I started this morning, you guys, there was an eight percent chance of a second. Oh, sorry, of a rate hike in September. It's back down to five percent. There was a huge movements here. Let's look at November. Okay, so November went down slightly this morning, but November's still, they're still getting, the market's still a little bit more realistic. 41% likelihood of a second rate hike in December. I'm sorry, November. Now, December's sitting at 40% chance. But what I'm more interested, you guys, I'm more interested about 2024. We pretty much know there's probably going to be another rate hike this year. But let me show you what happens next year. Now, first of all, what I want you guys to understand is here's where we're sitting. Now, when the rates adjust, this entire flow will change. But right now we're sitting at 525 to 550. What this is telling us is by the time we hit January, there's only about a 90%, there's 90% chance, no rate decline. So no rate cuts, 90% chance of no rate cuts. That's really good. So when we go to March, look at when we go to March, we're at, and let's see, it's, it's adjusted 70% roughly. So a little less than say... 69. So 69% likelihood, no rate cut. So more than half likelihood, no rate cut in March. That's good. Let's look at May. Okay. So we go to May here. Okay. So May is about 50, 50. So once we get to May, we're like 50, 50. And then June, June's only 27% chance. And then July is like 12% likelihood. We're going to remain at the elevated rates. So really, you guys, here's the reason I'm telling you guys this. I mean, we want to remain elevated when it comes to mortgage rates, especially in the front of next year's home buying season. Now, I believe as long as we have the recession, unemployment gets a bit unhinged, uh, rates stay elevated. We're going to crush through next year's home buying season like we weren't able to do this year. And I've asked myself, like, what happened? Why did the demand come back so strong? It's not just limited inventory. Because we have inventory, it's not just that. So really emotional, you guys. Let me show you where we're at with mortgage rates. Mortgage rates are up to 7.29%. Holy smokes. Raise your hand if you think, if we would have remained at this level of interest rates in March uh, when the bank runs happened, don't you guys think that demand would have been further cooled off? Do you guys think that because of the bank bailout, because remember, not only was the liquidity injected in March of this year, they also, the rates dropped to six and a quarter. So I really think that bank run really messed us up. Really, really messed us up, you guys. Um, what? Trisha. Okay, so Trisha. Hey, Trisha, don't hate on the little dogs, okay? This dog right here, this is Brightness, okay? This is my little dog, Brightness. Uh, it's a good dog. I plan on uh, breeding these dogs. I don't know. I'm going to probably dress it up as Halloween. Maybe one of them raisins. You guys remember the raisins? I'm going to probably dress uh, brightness up in a raisin. But this is just my little dog. I, I apologize for the picture yesterday with the alligator gar. I know there was a little bit of blood there. Um, but how do you know it wasn't my blood? Did you all see that thing? Woo. Okay. Anyway, so we're at 7.29%. Let me remove this. I just wanted you guys to laugh a little bit. I know it's cringe. I know I have dad humor, but I'm trying but usually I'm just embarrassing myself. Let me show you guys what it looks like for payments. So we're sitting at 7.29%. Here's the payments, you guys, uh, at a $400,000 house, only 10% down payment, a 700 credit score. Again, so here's the thing. Not only are people walking into like super high payments, like it costs a ton of money, you guys, generally for a down payment. Generally, generally, just depending on the loan option. But so there's a lot of things. Not only do I have to kill my liquidity, I now have to pay a lot more money per month than what I'm paying now. But anyways, on a $400,000 house at a 10% down payment, your payment is roughly going to be $3,200 unless you're in Texas because my property taxes, you guys in Texas for a $400,000 house would be closer to $12,000 a year. So in Texas, this would probably be $12,000 a year, but I'm just keeping averages. So average payment right now on a $400,000 house is somehow $3,100. 
That is brutal, you guys. That is absolutely insanity. So what we're going to do now, we're going to listen to our first video from Danielle DiMartino. Uh, and this one's good. This one is super good. Uh, and she's going to go into, guys, basically, um, this is crazy. She's going to go into a few things. This is, this is really why I like listening to her perspective. She's basically thinking that Jerome Powell may be doing too much because there's lag effects. So, but not only that, I also want you guys to pay attention to when she talks about the, let me make sure to put this up when she talks about watching the money. So she's like, you guys, like everyone's talking about interest rates, but what we should be talking about is the money is the M2 supplies, the fed balance sheet. Like everyone's stuck on a quarter basis point rate hike. Who cares about a quarter basis point rate hike? Look at all of this money disappearing. That's why I like listening to her, guys. She has really good perspective. Let's listen to what she has to say. I hope you guys enjoy it. And if you guys can, um, shoot me a brightness comment. If you guys like my dog, please put brightness in the comments and also let me know if the audio is okay. I hope you guys enjoy it. Yeah, you know, you know, Danielle, since you're from Texas, I'll say this. R rate hikes are kind of like drinking, right, <laughs> in a way. Where, you know, you don't know you've done too much until it's too late. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then you're sick. And I do worry that because this lag between raising rates and when things actually slow down, this is so aggressive. Why don't we just pause for a couple of months, pause for a couple of meetings, wait and see, because I just don't know if anybody knows what's going to happen when Jay Powell eventually stops going to the punch bowl. Well, I, I don't think any of us know, but there are ramifications, there are consequences, and we're seeing it play out in the Fed's weekly data. The Dallas Fed earlier this week came out with a banking survey. We've gone an entire year now, Brian, with tightening lending standards. Uh, that's, that's quite a, a, a big stretch. We got data out after the close, after the market closed today that shows that other deposits of U.S. commercial banks' liabilities have declined. Now they've declined by 8% over the course of one year reason I bring this up is because you're talking about pausing on rate hikes, but nobody is asking Jay Powell about the balance sheet. And that continues to decline. And that's why I think what was more important today was what he didn't mention. And that is the balance sheet and the fact that he's going to continue pulling liquidity out of the system, perhaps even after he begins lowering rates in 2024. Excellent point. I mean, I think the rate stuff, to your point, Danielle, does get all the headlines, the balance sheet may ultimately be more important. So Ben, put that into sort of plain speak for our audience by reducing the balance sheet, basically what they what they have bought over the last couple of years. What could that mean for interest rates and stocks and sort of the markets writ large? Well, we have one experience with that, that when they did do that in 2018, the market judged it like you went too far. You pulled too much liquidity out of the system and that causes friction. So what the Fed is doing currently is on an autopilot pulling money basically out of the system, if you call it that way. They automatic bought, selling. Automatic selling, if you think of it that way, right? They bought treasury bonds and gave the money to the banks, and now they're doing the reverse, but on autopilot. At some point, it's going to hit, a, I think, a level of, of liquidity in the system where the market says, like, that's enough. It will cause otherwise, a, a let's say, a friction in funding, a friction in mm -hmm. stock market. It's so. The Ben, I think, and, I'll, and we'll go there, I think it's, it's the oil that keeps the market engine going. Exactly. Correct. It's oil. And so if you, you do set oil, then at some point the engine starts sputtering, right? And then it doesn't yeah. work. Oh, by the way, Danielle, we got to go. But uh, oil, back around 80 bucks a barrel, that, that could also play an, an economic role. But we'll save that for another night. Danielle DiMartino We're Booth. Rigs. We're seeing rigs come offline, Brian. You saw that today. I know. Again, by the way, we got like a week up. Oh, the Hawks. The Hawks rule, you guys, the Hawks rule. Let me know, comment below. Let me know what you guys think about that. I do want to get her on my channel so bad. I commented a couple times on her videos, but I didn't get a response back. But I would absolutely love uh, to talk to her more and get her perspective. Um, you guys, a couple comments here. Throw up some comments if you guys have anything you want to say about that last video. Here's something from Living in Omaha. And basically, he's you know saying, Travis, don't you think rents will just spiral upwards as taxes, insurance, and home prices increase. So what basically, you know, the point he's trying to make is, is like as expenses get um, higher for investors, right? The investors are gonna, aren't investors just gonna pass that on to the tenants. And really, I think, you know, living in Omaha, I, I, David, um, I think what really is important 
is to understand is it, it really depends on how much inventory there is. For example, in my market, there is a ton of inventory. And we also know there's what, about a million units being built, or I'm sorry, under construction right now. On top of that, when we look at places that are banning STRs, short terms, those places are also going to change. Not all metros are have banned STRs, but like Dallas has, Las Vegas basically has, New York basically has. So the thing is, is with the STRs, that really hasn't like the boot hasn't really dropped yet. We haven't seen like an uptick in inventory per se yet, but we'll, we'll keep watching that. Basically, essentially, the metros and cities that have banned STRs, they have to enforce the law. If they're not enforcing the law, it doesn't matter. So when they force that law, I think, I think there's going to be a huge change in the rental market. Um, but I will say that traditionally, like in 2008, you guys, when there was a housing market crash, rents went up. I think the difference is this time in Omaha is the rent is also in a bubble. And what I mean by in a bubble is, is rent went up way faster than wages. And quite frankly, a lot of people can't afford that right now. Uh, here's a comment from Sacred as well. My student loan repayment was like $400 a month and he doesn't even have $20,000 in student loans like these people are rude, uh, uh, for, for rude awakening. Now, let me go into what he was saying real quick about student loans, you guys, because here's how student loans generally work. The more money you make, the more they're going to make you pay. So the more you make, the higher your liability. Because generally, not always, but generally, school loan repayment is based on your income bracket. So if you're like a, an attorney making $250,000 a year, your expenses aren't that much, they're going to charge you a lot more money. They're not just going to necessarily charge you the, the low amount. And I'm telling you guys that because this is hurting all like categories of consumer. Low, middle, high, right? Let me show you guys the money. Let's follow the money real quick. Since she did, she's going to inspire us to follow the money. Now, here's the wonderful, wonderful Fed balance sheet. Our Fed balance sheet updated yesterday. This is really good. This is really, really good, you guys, because this is showing us that the Fed is actually doing what they're saying they're doing, which is burning money out of the economy. They're selling treasuries. They're saying, okay, here, banks, buy this 4% treasury, pay us the money. When they get the money, they burn it. They make it disappear. That's what we want. And that's not what, and this is what I'm saying. Look at this. Look, so this is the little, you know, pushing out the recession brick wall that we hit right in front of buying season, literally the worst possible time for the housing market. They did quantitative easing because, and then rates went down. But anyways, guys, here's a beautiful thing. This is going down uh, pretty significantly. This is exactly what we want to see. Obviously, the, the more and more that the Fed reduces their balance sheet, the less the market's going to be propped up by them. So the more this goes down, the less propped up things are going to be. But what's the scary thing about the market being propped up? We now know because you know, we know that they could literally meet over the weekend and print more money. They did this without meeting Congress. You guys, do you guys remember TARP, the toxic uh, asset repayment program in the great financial collapse? They, they printed less money and it took an act of Congress. Here, they met over the weekend and printed even more money than the great financial collapse. This broke my soul when I saw this. It, because it, to me, it like this was a wake up call. This run up right here is like, this hurt me, you guys, because I was like, man, what happened to American values? What happened to manners? What happened to like accountability and transparency? This sh like was that slap in the face where like, Travis, America may not be as American as you think. That's what that showed me right there. But maybe I'm wrong. Okay, maybe um, maybe that was the smartest thing that he could have done. Okay, the, the jury's still out, but I will say it hurt. Now look at the M2 money supply. This is the M2. This now updates on four. This used to update weekly. They changed it uh, from weekly to monthly. This is M2. This is the total amount of money in the U.S. right now. So you guys can see for the first time in 20, what, 75 years, first time since the Great Depression, M2 went down. For the for 75 years, <laughs> 75 years. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And everything's okay, right? This is just seasonal. Everything is just you know, going really well. Um, but I mean, we, we, we printed the money. So is the market, that's the reason I'm saying, I don't think the economy is doing well. I don't think the consumer is doing well because it was unnatural. If the market, if we had a run up uh, because of natural things like people saving money, consumers doing well, wage growth. Okay sustainable. The fundamentals are there, but this was an unnatural occurrence because of COVID. 
So uh, why am I a bad person for saying that? People think I'm a bad person for saying that. I don't get it. But anyways, guys, um, this is going to update in probably two weeks. We want to see this go down really cool, even though it hasn't been going down since about May 22nd. So about three and a half months. At least it's been going sideways. This is good. All right. So again, if we do go into recession, it's okay. Here's the thing. If we go into recession and there's no more bailouts, that's probably going to go down. But if there's bailouts, that will probably go up, obviously. Now we're going to listen to our second video, you guys. <laughs> our second video is from CNBC, and it's going to go into basically the consumers are running out of money. So consumers are running out of money. This is going to go into that a little bit more. You guys can let me know if the audio is okay. Appreciate y'all. I hope you enjoy. Retail, let's ask Ike Borishow. How much pain is it already causing, do you think? Uh, yeah, hey, Kelly. So, look, I don't think it helps, right? It's been a nice tailwind year over year. Um, we've had the low-end consumer under some pressure. It's been an area where there's a little bit of hope, and now you're starting to see those uh, that tailwind kind of turn into a headwind. So, look, the way we kind of look at the consumer right now is, we're kind of running out of tailwinds and, and there's certainly more the consumer <laughs> catalyst path from here. It's not great. You've got gasoline prices on the rise. You've got credit tightening and delinquencies going up. And then the big, you know, canary in the coal mine or elephant in the room is student loan repayments starting October 1st. So the catalyst path is tough. This is just one of many that we're trying to keep our eyes on. And yet, you know, you've still got to cover the space. So <laughs> especially now that we've digested retail earnings, I'm sure that's done a lot to separate some of the winners from losers. Who are the names that you would stick with even throughout what could be an environment of sticky high oil, uh, gasoline prices? Yeah, look, I, I think if we're talking about who are the winners, where are we sleeping well at night? I think the two, uh, the, the, the two areas we look at is um, the off-price sector. Mm -hmm. So absolutely outperforming, comps accelerating, market share gains accelerating, the department store pain is their gain, inventory coming their way. So raw stores, Burlington are two of our favorite ideas. And then on the other side, um, you look at a business that's just completely bucking the trend within a slower athletic backdrop, Lululemon. I mean, they have overtaken Nike in terms of their real prominent athletic player globally right now. They're executing across the uh, across the board. And I would say off price and, and Lulu really look uh, really look very good. If you're willing to go down the risk curve a little bit to more recovery names, we think a name like Signet Jewelers, PVH, also very interesting. Signet and PVH. Okay. So, you know, I hear the caution that you're expressing. And, you know, people have just kind of caught up with this idea of no recession, let's raise our S&P targets. And of course, the last six weeks have looked a little less comfortable. So at what point do you go from being, you know, a little concerned to a lot more concerned? And, and maybe that's the labor market, I don't know. I mean, look, right now for us, it, it's a little, it's fairly binary. I think when you look at our group, um, very cyclical group, right? Early cycle group, valuations are very, are very close to trough. Numbers hmm. have been cut uh, to the bone, especially on, on earnings revisions this year. But what's the catalyst to get us in here? There's the boogeyman waiting there come October, November, and that's student loans. We're talking about $6 billion, uh, a couple points to comp headwind. And well, the reason I say it's bind area is traffic is pretty stable in the U.S. right now. We're either going to lap this and the consumer is going to show some resiliency or we're going to take a leg down like we saw in March when the low-end consumer fell off a cliff, you know, snap and a bunch of other headwinds hitting them. So I think we're going to wait and see. I think we're going to know a lot come early holiday about about the next uh, direction of this group. All right. I, it's fascinating a point about valuations and kind of where we are as well. Ike, thanks for your time as always. All right, guys. A um, little bit more honesty there. I'm going to pull up credit card debt in a minute. Let me pull up a few comments that you guys made while that was playing. Uh, here's the first one. This is the new normal. It's not going to get any uh, better anytime soon. I mean, I don't agree with that, but the thing is, is I think about it, right? I mean, what you know, any person that cares about and that's really trying to put themselves in a good situation is going to ask themselves like, what if, right? What if things don't change? So I've went deep guys. I went all the way back to the seventies and eighties to compare PE wage growth, the consumer, all of that type of stuff. Now I, you know, here's the thing. I don't think this is the new normal. I think that basically the powers that be are trying to keep us calm enough for long enough to where this whole thing resets. The reason I don't think this is a new normal, Jim, I'll explain, is the, for the lack of a better argument, PE ratio for one, and I'm talking about house and the price to earning ratio, it's out of control. 
I'm not just going to roll over and accept that. There's no way. Um, but also the affordability. You can't have 80% of consumers priced out of the housing market. 80? How many million is that? How many million is 80%? So I, I, don't, I don't think it's the new normal. But the thing is, Brother Jim, I'm preparing for it to be the new normal. So in my preparation on the sideline right now, when I'm increasing my credit, my income, and my uh, assets, I'm like, okay, I'm going in all in, right? I'm going to prepare for the worst. And what's the worst? Things don't change. So I think about it all the time. I just don't believe it's the new normal. I, 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 think, I think it's far from the new normal, man. But I understand why people think that. I could be wrong. But when I look at the data, when I look at history, we are freaking due for a recession, brother. We are do that. We are, we have earned it as Americans and consumers for the bust to happen because we didn't do this. We didn't do this. The government did the COVID, the corporations, the institutional investors, you know, the, these people with 300 doors, I have 300 doors. And I have a little dog. I mean, these are the people that caused this, not us. So I'm not going to pay for their greed. I'm going to wait for them to, anyway, I'm going to wait for them to come crashing down. Take a look at the consumers, you guys. Wait, sorry. A couple more questions. Let me, let me throw up Mr. Watson. Mr. Watson, I know we got off to a little bit bumpy start, brother, but I appreciate you coming back to the community. Uh, I appreciate your opinions and I appreciate the time it takes you to, to share them. Sorry for our past, man. And I, again, I appreciate you being here now. So let me read this because this is good. Um, I really, really, really respect this question. Travis, honest question. Do you think it would have been better of not to prevent the contagion in the banking sector back in March? I think more normal people would be hurting now. That's a good question. So at first, Mr. Watson, I was like, horrible, right? They, they should have let it crash. They should have let it bust because why are we bailing them out? We're not going to get bailed out. So at first, Mr. Watson, I was like, it was a bad idea. And honestly, I still believe it's possibly a bad idea. We won't, I won't have a conclusion of my opinion until we're through this. I can't see into the future, right? It will be a good idea. It would have been a good thing if we get our reset and crash in prices and things get more affordable. Then maybe it would have been a good thing. But if we don't get that and, and we have runaway inflation and, and consumers keep spending like crazy, then it was horrible. It was an absolutely horrible thing because the thing is, and Mr. Watson's right, if they would have let the banks crash and go out of business and bank runs, we would have been in recession already. We would have unhinged unemployment and the sediment would be completely changed. Completely changed if we had bank runs. Going into an election year, by the way, in 2024. I don't know, man. You know, that's a really good question, Mr. Watson. The jury's still out on that. Now, obviously, uh, appreciate this comment here. The car market is absolutely crazy. That's where it's kind of starting as well. Um, since when has the big money not been bailed out? Washington Mutual. Um, another question from sacred honest, uh, granted, I'm not going to buy a truck, but okay, here's the thing sacred, do what you got to do, right? I'm only trying to help you with your purchasing power. I'm I only want people to become winners and be ahead. If you have to take care of business, brother, you take care of business, but I will say, remember this. If there's one thing that I taught you, if you add a payment, I'm not talking about paying it off in full, but if you add a payment to your monthly expenses that will deteriorate your purchasing power. So I would say just make sure by doing that, by purchasing a vehicle, make sure you can still afford the home you want. Because sacred, it's possible that by buying a truck or a vehicle, you would hurt your opportunity to purchase a house. And remember a car is a depreciating asset. Well, a house right now is probably a depreciating asset too, but generally, in a normal environment, the house is actually uh, a really good asset. Uh, here's something from Mr. Big Boy, even though he's not acting like a big boy. The sky is falling, run for your lives. You know, we get this comment all the time, like, oh, the sky is falling. Like, what are we talking about, guys? Are we, are we talking about being scared in a corner? What do people think we're talking about on, on this channel? What do, what do you guys think we're talking about? Things like, oh, don't buy, go in a corner and, and stay afraid. No. If you're going to be on the sidelines, make sure you're empowering yourself. Income, credit, <laughs> purchasing power. Expert on your local market. Understand the data. These people are wacko. You want to know who the sky is falling? The people that are preaching the sky is falling? The investors with these little dogs. The sky is falling. you got to buy right now. Realtors are saying the sky is falling. Not me, son. Not me. Realtors 
sky is falling. You have to buy now. It's just going to get more unaffordable. You've missed your opportunity. If you didn't buy in 2022, you're stuck with the new normal. That's the sky is falling, sir. Why am I saying that? Unaffordability and PE ratio. That alone, that alone, oh my God, what's wrong with these people? But thank you for commenting. Let me show you guys again, consumer credit. Okay, so here's the thing. Consumers probably have ran out of a lot of money. <laughs> and actually I've read a report that uh, excess savings will be done next month. Think about that. Next month, excess savings, according to the report, will be gone. And guess what else happens next month? The fall buying season? Yeah, maybe. School loans start, okay? So we have school loans start next month. We have unemployment going up. We have credit card debt exploding. Credit card debt is over a trillion dollars. A trillion. One trillion dollars in credit card debt. So what's happening right now is even though a lot of consumers are out of excess savings, they are not out of credit. People still have the ability to charge credit. People still have the ability to get that really, really horrible, horrible credit card debt. This is a huge problem. And I already checked, you guys, since January of this year, people have spent about $50 billion, 50 to $60 billion. <laughs> Johnny, I looked at your comment. Look at Johnny's comment. You better be on tomorrow, Johnny. I'm hoping this man right here, Johnny Fly, he's going to be on with us tomorrow for a live. I want you guys to grill my man, Johnny, okay? He can handle it. But anyways, guys, $50 billion in what? Nine, eight months, eight full months, $50 billion. So, you know, when people say consumers are strong, I think what they're saying is, is like they still have credit, they can still spend. But to me, a strong consumer is a consumer that is not in debt. To me, a strong consumer is a consumer that spends you know what they, they they don't spend as much as they make they're able to save money they're able to do things like that so this is why i don't you know i don't believe it's it's a it's a strong consumer i just believe that they're you know they're, they're set up to continue to spend they haven't the credit tightening hasn't happened enough now our next video is really intriguing because this is by mark zandy uh with moody analytics and mark has been calling pretty good pretty good estimates on what's going to happen next. Now, this is going to be Mark basically saying that the basically the reason why things have stayed the way they are is the consumer. And unless the consumer gets crippled, there's going to be no recession. So, you know, again, that's why we watch unemployment. That's why we watch things like that. But listen to what he has to say. This is a, this is someone that I listen to. Are we truly in a sweet spot where we can avoid recession despite a slowdown? Or are we celebrating prematurely and just entering the point at which we'll know the full effect of the Fed's rate hikes and all this bank turmoil? For more, let's bring in Moody's Analytics Chief Economist Mark Zandi with the aforementioned Steve Leesman, our Chief Economics Correspondent. <laughs> Welcome to both of you. Steve, let's start with Waller's comments. Obviously, he, he was saying more than that, but he, like many, were really cheering the data, fewer job openings and labor market moderation that we saw last week. Yeah. I mean, let's just put Waller in a little bit of context. You know, when he doesn't frown, it's like he's smiling, right? I mean, he's not the most jubilant uh, person to begin with, but and, and I wouldn't say he was ebullient about the data, but he was not that bad about it. He's a little bit more on the hawkish side, sounded a little bit more on the dove side in no particular hurry, would hike again. I do want to make a remark about Goldman's call. It's not remarkable to me they went from 20 to 15. What's remarkable is they're doubling down on saying the chance of recession is less than average. Yeah, way okay? less than average. Okay, so in any given year, there's a one in four, one in five chance of a recession happening. I don't think Jan is really going crazy about going 2015. I think what he's saying to, to, to us in this call is that it's a less than average chance, which is pretty significant. I don't necessarily see the data that way. I don't feel like we're out of the woods on all the possibilities that could create a recession, but certainly we've come a long way in terms of defying the recession probabilities that have been and out there. And he's been correct about that, you know, to, to his credit, which is why, Mark, he's so worth listening to on this. There, you know, the, some would say the biggest reason why we're holding in there is fiscal stimulus and fiscal spending. But Hatzius also says, number one, he thinks that the labor market's going to hold up. So income growth will support spending. And number two, and I thought this was interesting, he thought the Fed's rate hikes would be fully felt in the economy by early 2024, whereas others seem to be waiting for more of a lag. Well, I'm optimistic, Kelly. I, you know, I, I, I'm not as optimistic as Jan uh, uh, at 15%. You know, Steve, I think that's actually the average probability of recession. If you have a recession every six or seven years. So he's, I think he's saying, you know, kind of typical recession odds. I think that's a little bit optimistic, but I'm optimistic as well. I mean, I, I do think that 
uh, with inflation coming in as gracefully as it is, uh, in large part because that inflation is the result of the supply shocks created by the pandemic and Russian war. And as those shocks fade into the rearview mirror, we're getting inflation back in without any real damage to the labor market and to the broader economy. I think that's the most significant reason for optimism. And as that inflation comes in, you know, now wage growth is stronger than inflation. So we are seeing so-called real wage gains. People's purchasing power is improving. <laughs> and that allows folks to continue to spend as long as the consumer hangs tough, you know, continues to do what they typically do. Uh, recession doesn't look likely. Hmm. Okay. I don't feel like a strong consumer. And you guys, I have four jobs. I don't feel, and I have cash flow. I mean, I, I don't feel like a strong consumer. Let me show you guys where we're sitting at as far as the recession. Let's take a look at the inverted yield curves. Here's the 10 and the two year right now. The inversion is still at 67 basis point inversion. We've been inverted now for over 14 months. The average time of inversion, 15 months. So we're knocking on the door of like, okay, here's the recession. So like, and, and we're due for a recession, even without COVID, even without COVID. And then, and then people are like, no, there's no recession, soft landing. I mean, every time someone says soft landing, we go into hard landing. Literally, if we go back and look. But anyways, the inversion's still there. We're still at 67. It's really not got above into the 50s uh, in quite some time since May. Again, this you can see that here. Again, this is the bank bailout. Really messed things up. So, it, you know, the bank bailouts, March, messed things up for many, many reasons. Remember the tenure also went down uh, and the inversion was only 42 bips. But right now you guys are sitting at 67 bips. Let me show you the, this is crazy. Okay. Um, talking about runaway inflation. This is the five-year break even. This is what the Fed is watching because they don't want the market to get unhinged. The expectations of the market to be unhinged. They want this to go down. This will signal the Fed is okay to reduce interest rates when this is under 2%. Right now it's at 224 basis points or 2.24%. But I want to, you guys, to really look at what's like, there's like a tell of two cities with the market as well. Like some of the market, most of the markets like risk off. And then some of the markets like, let's send it. Let's just send it. It's going to be okay. Uh, stocks eventually go up. Right. But look at, look at this, you guys. In one week, it went from 2.15, which was like a new low. Okay. Except, you know, going back to July and then it shot back up and said, nah, there's runaway inflation still. Now guys, here's the thing. Where do you think the inflation's from? Do you guys know? Do any anyone know where the inflation's from? Where, where's the inflation stickiest? Is it eggs? Is it bacon? Is it gas? What, what do we care about? We care about shelter. We care about the, the housing market inflation is the reason why there's inflation, right? It's not hard to understand that. So um, <laughs> there's almost like, I'm going to just say like in 2023, like in many metro areas, obviously not all metro areas, in many metro areas, there was one runaway inflation. And, and the thing is, is like, they got to do something about that. Unless the prices and the PE, price to earning ratio goes down, uh, this is going to be overwhelming for pretty much everyone. Unless you're like, you know, this, this super rich person. Anyways, you guys, we're going to move, move on to our last video, which is basically the Fed is going to remain hawkish until inflation really comes down. So this is people saying that they're going to keep doing quantitative tightening, keep hurting us until the inflation is going down. And we know that the housing market inflation and shelter inflation is the stickiest. And it's also the biggest factor at things like core CPI, PCE, things like that. So the housing market is incredibly important. So the fact that the Fed rarely talks about the housing market, why do you think that is? They don't want to talk about the housing market. Why do you think they don't want to talk about the housing market? Probably because things are going to reset. They're going to go down and they don't want to have a total pandemonium freak out. I believe they're lying to us on purpose, just like Ben Bernanke did in the great financial collapse. That's what I think is happening, y'all. I don't know what y'all think. I, you know, I think some of you guys think that. But anyways, enjoy this video. Hope you enjoy. Head of global inflation linked research is here to talk a bit about inflation and, uh, and fixed income outlook as well as the economy. Michael, good to see you. Uh, you know, we uh, we obviously are expecting, based on the consensus, just a little bit of a pause in this disinflation move in terms of core PCE that we've seen for a while. But we also have uh, Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic overnight in a speech, essentially almost declaring victory, saying if you took out the lagging shelter components of inflation, we're almost 
at target in terms of core C, uh, CPI as well as PCE. Where do you come down on this idea that uh, inflation is already largely taking care of itself? <laughs> Well, we do think it'll it'll pause, and we actually think we'll get a bit stronger number in the core PC, especially in the super core. So stripping out shelter within services, uh, we actually think it will come in at a fairly strong 0.5, which is not going to leave the Fed with an impression that they're making continued progress. That inflation, while down from its peak, is still too high. So even Atlanta Fed President Bostic's comments, while the market is taking it as a bit dovish, um, he indicated that they, he thinks, again, he's one of the more dovish members, he thinks that they'll be on hold at a high level of rates for quite some time. The market is pricing in cuts as early as the beginning of next year. So we think the market is still bearish relative to the outlook and not fully getting the message that the Fed is keeping at it. That's really been the message since Jackson Hole 2022 that was reiterated uh, at Jackson Hole 2023. We think that the Fed will remain uh, on the hawkish side until inflation really does come down much further to its target. I, I, get, I grant that you know the Fed funds futures market does start to price in some uh, some cuts out there, but does that, in your mind, mean that most investors genuinely expect there to be cuts, or is that just kind of the way we manage risk in this economy? The Fed's almost done, so the next significant move is likely to be uh, a cut, or at least we want to have a just-in-case trade on. Uh, in the event that does uh, that the economy weakens. Yeah, I think that's a really important point about how markets price. Markets don't just price for baseline scenarios. And if you th they're you know just above five, if you think there's a, there's a chance of zero uh, by the end of next year because of some absolute yeah. crisis, well, there's probably not much of a chance of ten percent. So again, if you're if you're yeah, right. leaning, uh, <laughs> are, are, are rates going to be five percent higher or five percent lower? Uh, right. Chances are there will be five percent lower, but we think that the market is still uh, priced for too much confidence, too much risk of that downside scenario, uh, and we think real short end real yields are poised to to continue to move higher as mm -hmm. they have been. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, what do you make of the fact that we we did see a pretty significant rally in Treasury, so yields coming down over a couple of days, uh, based on arguably some secondary economic uh, inputs, right? You had the uh, the jolts number, which of course is widely watched, but never was uh, front of mind. And then the ADP payrolls data. Does that just tell you we were wound pretty tight, uh, expecting a, a hotter numbers? Yeah, the market did pr sell off pretty hard over the prior weeks. And so it was probably due for a, a bit of a pullback. Uh, but today and tomorrow, especially tomorrow is the main show when it comes to the data. Uh, ADP and, and the JOLTS data are certainly good at leading indicators, but tomorrow's employment report, uh, payrolls, but also average hourly earnings. So wage growth has been strong. We think it'll be continue to be strong in tomorrow's number, up 0.4, and that payroll growth will continue to be too strong for the Fed to believe that inflation will come in consistent with its 2% target. We're expecting yeah. uh, 200 all righty, you guys. So got some more info there. And what I'm going to do is let's go back here. It's going to kind of wrap it up a little bit. Let me know if you guys have some questions. I want to take some questions if you have, have any. If you guys have any, I'm going to throw uh, this right here from KOV. Travis uh, is discretionary spending figured out when over two thirds of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. I think our data we see is way off and misleading. We already know, KOV, that the data is misleading and the data is off. How do we know that? Because of the revisions. They make revisions every single month in a downward direction. That means they're always over-optimistic. The date, every Look at the data sets, job market. I mean, just, seriously, guys, look at the revisions that people, he's, he's right. He's right. Um, it's just crazy. There's so many people who haven't accounted for mortgage forgiveness is kicking in for folks. They can sell for a profit if they took the moratorium. So they can't sell for a profit if they owe more than they can get for the house. So someone will get profit if, I thought this was a different question, if they can get, well, the thing is, is the other thing is, is guys, if generally if the mortgage company is going to do some type of forgiveness on the loan, it means they have no equity. It wouldn't make sense necessarily for a lender necessarily to reduce the principal if there's equity in the house. But the thing is, is kissing bombs when it comes to foreclosures and loan modification, 
foreclosures right now are low. They're going up. Defaults are going up. Things are getting more affordable. Obviously, we know all of this. But as a result of the you know moratoriums and the equity run up, uh, foreclosures just weren't there. There was no need. And then also, guys, understand that loan modifications this time around are a lot stronger than in 2008. But I also want to point out this, kissing bombs. Even though right now loan modification is stronger than 2008, the banks right now are doing well, relatively well. So if we see banks go out of business or bank runs and things of that nature, I can tell you that these lenders will be less forgiving. Do you understand what I'm saying? They will not have the ability to take less money. So again, the more the financial system hurts, the more we all hurt, in, in my opinion, of course. Congratulations to my man, Jeff. This is our brother in our community. He got a new job. Jeff is a homeowner. We have a couple of homeowners on our channel. Uh, that purchased homes based on, you know, basically Jeff, the thing with Jeff guys is he never gave up. He always wanted to be a homeowner. He, he hated the prices, but he never gave up. When he found something that he loved, he understood what he wanted. He understood his goals and he didn't just offer the asking price. The man got a deal on a house for $30,000 to $40,000 under market value by writing a letter from his heart and soul. Do y'all understand? So what I'm saying is, is to Jeff, home ownership was important to him. But also what was important to Jeff is getting a great deal. You guys, he was able to do that in a very tight market at the peak of home values. There's something that needs to be said there. It, and what, I, what lesson I learned from Jeff is do not lose hope. Do not lose hope. Just because we don't see everything on fire per se right now, doesn't mean we can't find a great deal. It's just more unlikely, right? It, it is unlikely, but what I'm saying is, is like props to that man. Um, oh, Eric, it's hard not buying a house with three kids. I have four kids and I know, uh, but I am not going to be dead broke and putting my family in a massive debt and on an inflated house. I'm waiting for the Fed rate cut and then I'll reevaluate. I think this is smart, Eric. I think it's smart because we don't have to join and stand in line with the people that are obsessed with home buying, toxic. We, we, we don't have to be in that crowd of people. I'm going to just stay out. I'm going to let that people finish doing their thing. And then when it all comes crumbling down per se, depending on the metro area, I'm going to do the same thing and reevaluate is if I don't find a deal before then, because I'm looking every day, but it is hard, Eric. And that's why I think it's so important that we spend quality time with our family to remember what's important in life. Because right now people are assuming that what's important right now is to be a homeowner when it's the most unaffordable and the highest PE ratios that we've ever had. So, you know, I think it's smart to reevaluate, man. And because none of us know what's going to happen for sure, I think we should always reevaluate. Here's another comment. Housing has gone up so much, even if we wait and prices don't go down, it's unlikely they'll climb much from the current unaffordability. Continued deadlock seems the worst case scenario. So that's another scenario, you guys, that things are just sideways for, you know, a long time. Um, but that's going to depend, obviously, you guys, on the metro area. Um, a lot of love, Jeff. I'm not sure if you're seeing these comments, but you're getting a lot of love here. All right, guys, that's really going to be it. Again, join us tomorrow. I'm going to try to have Johnny. He He's going to promise me he's going to be polite. He's going to be kind. But uh, I'm really excited that, you know, I talk about Johnny a lot. I'm really excited to talk uh, to talk to him. I'm really excited to bring a viewer on. I, you know, I admire you guys so much. And the strength, a lot of you guys are stronger than me. You guys motivate me. I, <laughs> I can't tell you, you know, for all those little troll comments and people bash me all the time, you guys, um, I have another 30 comments from you guys that are uplifting. And I, and I just want to say that that doesn't go unheard of. And, and your comments, especially that are kind and respectful, they mean so much to me. And you guys, even if people don't agree with me, I, I feel like, you know, with Jeff, even Vital, I feel like we've made, <laughs> Johnny, you're messing me up. Stop it. Johnny's messing me up. Honestly, guys, you know, even with people that don't agree with me, I feel like we've been able to and I know this is social media. I know this is video, but I feel like we've been able to generate friendships. So just because people don't agree with everything we're saying doesn't mean we can't be friends and doesn't mean we can't strengthen each other. The reason I have an issue with some people is because they're abrasive, egotistic maniacs <laughs> and there's no reasoning with them. And that's really why I have you know some issues. But anyways, you guys, there's my man, House Hacker. This guy right here, you guys, I just want to throw his name out. This guy found a, a deal in San Diego 
in 20, in one of the hardest metro areas, just like Jeff. So I'm throwing his number up here, not to say, you know, be this heartless, egotistic investor. He, I don't think he is. The reason I'm throwing this up here is he was able to find a deal in one of the most difficult housing markets in the nation. What does that tell us? Tells us, should tell us that if we are equipped and understand how to find a great deal, that we can find one. Now, is it hard right now? Yeah, it's really hard. Will it be easier in the future? I believe so because prices will go down in, in many metro areas, maybe not all, but most metro areas, I believe that. You guys gotta do research. You guys gotta do the research, you guys. Please do the research. If you're a realtor, step up. Really appreciate you guys. I don't care if you're realtors. I love realtors too, you guys. I, the good ones, right? I can't stand the bullying. I'm trying to tone it down. Hope you guys like brightness. Brightness is here to just keep me composed. L look at how good a dog bright. This is a well-trained dog. No, no fussing. Just really well-trained. Really care about brightness. Hopefully you guys like it. Melissa, I see you, Melissa. I appreciate you, girl. Uh, you guys show love to Melissa. Where's Dave at? I don't know where you are, Dave. Uh, you guys are the best, Jane. You're the best. I can't do this without you guys. I hope you understand that. Okay. Um, chat turns toxic. Why does it turn toxic, man? This chat, the live chat does? I hope it doesn't, man. You guys, don't be toxic, please, on the live chat. Be kind and, and courageous uh, you know, and helpful to each other. I would really appreciate that. I think that you guys are so amazing. Please show the community how amazing you are. And other than that, guys, if you're out there investing in real estate, you know I wish you luck. Happy Friday. Have a great weekend. See you guys tomorrow. And I will have an evening video. I did one more video on the beach. There's going to be no blood, okay? Just a video on the beach. Really appreciate you. Um, and other than that, guys, I hope you win. Take care. See you.